Uh, well, it's lovely to be here. I don't uh, greatly enjoy travelling, but I do very much enjoy being in Denmark. Uh, and I'm uh, coming in part because I think uh, as an outsider, uh, I may be able to uh, reinforce or foster your own view as to why Denmark is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I am going to try to persuade you uh, that uh, your mission to the world should include uh, trying to make everyone's community child mental health better by setting us a wonderful example. Now, uh, I hope Hans Christian Andersen would have enjoyed this picture. Uh, it's uh, uh, not mostly about uh, these particular swans. We're going to come back to uh, why swans have got into the story at all. Uh, these uh, beautiful white <coughs> swans you can see in a frosty uh, landscape. Uh, here we can see many more white swans uh, in a slightly sunnier landscape. And uh, more, still all white swans uh, against a, a green landscape. The point, as I think many of you will know if you're familiar with Popper, uh, is uh, that uh, we in Europe spent uh, thousands of years looking at swans uh, and all the swans we looked at were white and it was one of the uh, most certain views in the world along with the sun will rise tomorrow morning uh, that swans are all white that's just one of the things about swans and yet uh, when Europeans first went to Australia they found a black swan that broke that particular rule and it didn't take, having previously observed repeatedly millions upon millions of swans, all of whom were white, which in terms of an inductive view of science would have proven beyond all possible doubt that all swans were white, it only takes one black swan to prove that not all swans are white. <laughs> okay, so the strong logic behind refutation. Now, uh, I should say before moving on uh, that if you've been hearing about black swans over the last 10 or so years, particularly since the financial crisis, it may well have been in a different context. And I want to dismiss this so you don't get confused about this. Uh, financial wizards, or so-called wizards, uh, whilst in the course of breaking the financial system and much of our world, uh, would uh, make risk estimates and conclude that some things were so vanishingly unlikely that we didn't need to worry about them. It turned out that actually that was what brought, brought our world down uh, and they still refer to these as black swan events. But when I'm referring to black swans, I'm not referring to things that just happen to be rare because people have miscalculated the risk, uh, but to Karl Popper uh, and his philosophy of science and his view that central to much good science at least, is uh, the idea that we should take our assumptions and we should work very hard not to prove them by showing them again and again and again to be true, but to disprove them. And uh, this will eventually bring me back uh, to why uh, I'm uh, talking to you today in a child mental health slot. And that's because of what I have observed, and I, I think it, this has been a shared observation with many of my colleagues from around the world, uh, that there is a discrepancy between how well uh, specialist and community child mental health services seem to be doing. Uh, now, there's no doubt, to my mind, that there are excellent specialist child mental health services in many places uh, providing evidence-based treatments with good outcomes for things like obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, where uh, the natural history would be for these disorders to persist, maybe for 10 or more years, often actually 10 years before people even uh, appear in mental health services, and yet to be in many cases, well, in nearly all cases treatable, and in many cases uh, curable, with a limited number of sessions. And there are excellent examples of that from uh, within Denmark, for example. Now, as against this excellence with referred specialist conditions, my uh, impression uh, is that uh, community services often struggle to provide even half-decent service 
in the face of overwhelming demand and little capacity for early intervention or prevention. Now, the early intervention or prevention is important because when I'm talking about community services, what I'm talking about are services where people don't get there uh, always by being referred, someone has picked them up and sent them along, but by services that have a catchment area. They have a population of children that they are meant to be responsible for. And we know uh, from many places and many people, stretching back certainly to Mike, and probably uh, further back even than that, that many of the uh, children who have the sorts of disorders that would warrant treatment never get seen by anyone and receive treatment. The gap has narrowed slightly over the years, but there's still a large gap. So a community service, the ones where I think that they are often struggling, uh, in part because of funding, but in part because of the potential uh, the enormous scope that they have to be dealing with are the ones who should be looking after a particular patch. Could be of Copenhagen, could be of London, wherever. Now, as a result of the fact that many of them are struggling, I think that very frequency, frequently the people involved in them become tired and demoralised and conclude that nobody can make a good job of community child mental health. This is a refrain that I've heard from people from all over the world. And this pessimism is naturally going to be, to some extent, self-fulfilling. If you're dispirited in a job where you feel you haven't got enough resources to do the job and where no one's likely to succeed very well, then it's hard to keep up your motivation. It's hard to uh, enthuse the people that you're treating and trying to uh, convince can change. Now, this is the, uh, as it were, the, the hypothesis that nobody can make a good job of child mental health that I would like us systematically to refute and where I think you stand a particularly good chance here in Denmark of being able to refute. Maybe you will tell me afterwards you have refuted it, that you do have uh, this uh, model service, and that would be great. I'd love to hear more about it. So to put the thing another way, where is the Black Swan service that succeeds in promoting child mental health and providing excellent help to the entire community that it serves. Now, why do I think that Denmark could be just the right place for finding the black swan that refutes self-defeating pessimism about community child mental health? Uh, well, just to note, of course, having gone through the question of the black swan, that even one demonstration site for excellent community child mental health services would be important for the whole world. People everywhere, in Brazil or Bangladesh, would have to stop saying, we can't do this, nowhere has done this, and have to switch to saying, well, they have done it, in Denmark, say, and we haven't yet been able to catch up with them, but we see no reason why we shouldn't, in principle, with the right sort of investment, the right sort of training, be able to catch up. Why Denmark? Uh, I think the scale is right, uh, that uh, not too big, not too small, uh, able uh, to be sufficiently integrated with one another that there's a good chance that clinicians can talk to policymakers back and forth and that uh, people don't get consigned to silos of one particular profession or one particular area, but with the chance to be able to think things through uh, at a uh, national level. There's a spirit of collaboration, uh, which uh, I find absolutely admirable. Uh, the, uh, there are, there, I'm, I'm a great fan of our King Alfred, uh, who famously uh, defeated the Danes. But I suspect that we might have done rather better if King Alfred had lost. And uh, we had a, a country that was more similar to Denmark in many ways, in terms of a focus on the community and public health aspects, uh, as opposed to a rather more Anglo-Saxon focus on individual success. Um, so it's a country that is sympathetic to a public health approach. You have many uh, well-trained professionals across many disciplines and settings, ranging uh, from education to the criminal justice system to paediatrics. Uh, you have routine monitoring of child mental health in schools, and I know a bit about this because uh, at least one of the measures is one that uh, I've uh, been involved with for a long time, the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, and that is routinely administered in at least many of the municipalities uh, in Denmark. And 
Last, but definitely not least, you have your wonderful registers. What that means is uh, that the mental health data that is collected in schools can be linked uh, and is being linked by you uh, to important long-term outcomes such as uh, educational attainments, uh, employment, adult mental health and substance use, accidents, crime, and because the positive is important, it's not just a list of negatives, happiness, well-being, flourishing, the triv cell that we saw in the uh, in initial slide, and that I think it, it, it is, is extremely important. A uh, methodological diversion. This will be brief, so you don't have time to go to sleep whilst we talk about the methodology. We will be moving back off it again very rapidly. Uh, that uh, observational data are easier to collect than trial data, but they can be misleading. Uh, there are uh, confounders, which may or may not have been measured, uh, and that, uh, and beyond that, that, that there are unknown confounders that uh, you won't have been able to measure because you don't know about them. Now, some of this, uh, but not all of it, uh, can be tackled uh, through propensity matching, can at least narrow the gap, uh, in which uh, you uh, try adjusting uh, for the things, uh, the confounders that you've measured, uh, for instance. Now, at the very least, uh, we, we can maybe discuss later how far uh, this approach can work, that, what are the limitations on it. Uh, but at the very least, uh, then uh, high-quality observational data may suggest promising directions for further investigation, even though it doesn't represent any sort of strong proof uh, for uh, whatever it is that we're looking at. It's also possible uh, to examine the effects of local variety and innovation. Now, I don't want to sound like Chairman Mao, uh, but uh, in the spirit of let a hundred flowers bloom, I think it's great that many people do experiment with approaches of their own, many of which are not, or not yet, evidence-based, but uh, we can use this uh, from school through to register outcome uh, data in order to uh, have a look at whether it seems to have made a difference. If uh, Aarhus adapt one uh, adopt one particular uh, school-based program, Erdens a, a different one, Copenhagen a third one, then propensity matching to try allowing for the differences between the schools and the, and the children who were assessed in the three sites, we can uh, get at least a uh, fair idea as to how they done in the long term, in terms of whether they've completed their schooling, whether they've had more traffic accidents, whether uh, they have had difficulties or not getting into the job market. Now, uh, the, uh, the gold standard, of course, for whether something works, uh, is uh, a proper randomized controlled trial. And for, for all the emphasis that I've put up to now on using the observational data to inform what we're doing, uh, then uh, I'm a great fan of the randomized controlled trial. But we'll only note uh, that uh, these two can be helped uh, by the sorts of data uh, that are being collected in Denmark because one of the hallmarks of a great trial is not only that there's randomization, it's done well, and there's con uh, uh, allocation concealment and so on, but that you have uh, good long-term follow-up. And here is another instance in which uh, the uh, register data providing potentially uh, longitudinal uh, data um, across quite long periods of time and important outcomes mean that you can be uh, finding out things that, will, that are definitely more challenging for people in the rest of the world. Last little diversion. Uh, at about the time I was born, uh, then uh, there were very few uh, treatments that worked for childhood leukemia. It was rapidly fatal. I was actually suspected of having leukemia at that time. Uh, didn't have it, uh, but if I had, I would not have lasted very long. Things have changed a great deal uh, since then. Uh, most children with leukemia are, uh, survive and survive with a high quality of life and can be considered cured. And that came not through any one 
massive breakthrough. But from the uh, systematic use of trials, solving one problem as to whether A was better than B, and then going down to smaller problems, whether B1 was better than B2, uh, to work out what the optimum treatment would be. I'd like to argue that uh, all of us around the world can contribute to trying to do the same uh, for child mental health, but I think uh, you here in this room, uh, you who have the benefits of uh, uh, being Danish, can potentially help even more to this process of global importance. Thank you.